Hey everyone, it's Dr. Marcon, and I will be going over chapter two in your anatomy book, and this is about um, cells, which are the living units. So just a really quick overview, there are several very important scientists that actually made discoveries about cells. First we have Robert Hooke. Uh, Robert Hooke first observed plant cells with a very crude microscope in the late 1600s. Then we have Matthias Schleiden and Theodore Schwann. Uh, Schleiden and Schwann actually um, in the 1830s boldly asserted that all living things are composed of cells. Shortly after that, we have Rudolf Virchow, um, who extended this idea by contending that cells only come from other cells. Now, this kind of challenged the prevailing theory of the time, um, where people believe that organisms can arise from non-living matter, and this was known as the theory of spontaneous generation. Basically, living things just spontaneously generated, but we know that that is not true, and uh, Virchow's theory that um, cells coming from other cells actually uh, still holds true today. So we know that cells are the smallest living units in the body. We know that cells can obtain nutrients, make molecules needed to survive, dispose of waste, um, maintain the shape or their shape of the cell, as well as replicate and make more cells. We have structures within the cells called organelles. Organelles are subunits of cells that have specific functions. Uh, and most cells do contain the same basic organelles. However, not all cells have all organelles in the same abundance. For example, uh, we will talk about mitochondria. Mitochondria is an organelle that is responsible for uh, ATP production. ATP is needed for energy. And we have skeletal muscles that move and need ATP for energy. So cells within skeletal muscle will have more mitochondria so that they can have more ATP for movement. Okay. Um, whereas there are other cells who don't really use a lot of ATP, so they might not have as much mitochondria as, say, a, a skeletal muscle cell. Now cells have three very main components. There's the outer boundary known as the plasma membrane, and then within the cell we have the cytoplasm, which contains most organelles. And the control center of the cell we know is the nucleus, and the nucleus controls all cellular activities. And here is just a basic structure of a generalized cell. So we can see within the center of the cell is the nucleus um, uh, contained within a nuclear envelope. Uh, we can see that there is a smaller structure called the nucleolus. Uh, and then we can see chromatin within the nucleus. And then we have this outer plasma membrane, which basically um, holds the shape of the cell and kind of holds everything inside and then within the cell we have the cytoplasm that um, where we can find the different organelles within the cell and then we'll go over the different organelles uh, in just a little bit so the plasma membrane defines the extent of the cell. It separates the intracellular fluid within the cell from the extracellular fluid outside and between the cells. The structure of the plasma membrane, we know that it is based on a fluid mosaic model, meaning it has a lipid bilayer. Uh, within the lipid bilayer, uh, we can see types of membrane proteins throughout. For example, we have integral proteins. These integral proteins are firmly embedded in the plasma membrane or attached to the lipid bilayer. We also have uh, short chains of carbohydrates that are attached to the integral proteins that form the glycocalyx. We also have peripheral proteins that attach to the membrane surface. Uh, these proteins support the plasma membrane from the cytoplasmic side. And here we can see the fluid mosaic model of the uh, plasma membrane, we see that lipid bilayer. So there are two layers of lipids um, forming the 
uh, the plasma membrane. We have um, an inward facing layer of the phospholipid and then the outward facing layer of the phospholipids. Uh, so we can see, you know, the head of the uh, phospholipid and then the tails uh, within. So two layers of lipids forming that, um, that membrane, um, that lipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. So the phospholipid molecule is actually what makes up the, um, the, the bilayer of the plasma membrane. It has a polar head, uh, which we can see by these little circles. And these uh, polar parts of the phospholipid, they're actually hydrophilic. So philic means you know, something that is attracted to or like. So uh, a hydrophilic end of the phospholipid molecule means that it actually do is attracted to water. Um, and then we have a non-polar tail of the uh, phospholipid molecule, and these are actually hydrophobic, meaning they are not attracted to water. They're actually um, uh, not afraid, but basically not attracted to. So we have two parts of the phospholipid molecule. So we have that polar hydrophilic head and then the non-polar tail, which is hydrophobic. And then in this picture, we can see the different proteins that we talked about. We have these integral proteins that are embedded uh, throughout the phospholipid bilayer. We also have peripheral proteins um, located on the surfaces of the phospholipid bilayer. And then we have the carbohydrates that are attached to or can be attached to the, the plasma membrane uh, forming a glycocalyx. So functions of the plasma membrane, um, basically they relate to the location at the interface of the cell's exterior or outer part and the interior, which is the inner part. Um, the plasma membrane can provide a barrier against substances outside the cell. Um, and then we do have some plasma membrane that do act as receptors uh, for, for certain things such as hormones um, or neurotransmitters. Uh, functions, other functions of the plasma membrane can also uh, include determining what substances can enter or leave the cell. So we know that the membrane is selectively permeable, meaning uh, it can basically decide what can come into the cell or what can leave the cell. Plasma membrane is um, is important for transport into for of molecules within the cell or um, or leaving the cell. So, uh, type of membrane transport we're going to first talk about is um, the first one will be simple diffusion. So, simple diffusion is basically the tendency of molecules to move down their concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We then have osmosis. Whenever you hear the word osmosis, think water. So osmosis is basically the diffusion of water molecules across a membrane. Uh, note that simple diffusion and osmosis do not require energy. Okay, so it, it's basically a simple diffusion of uh, areas of high concentration to low. In the case of, mosis, of osmosis, that being the movement of water molecules. So here we can see in this first um, part of the diagram, simple diffusion, we have simple diffusion of fat soluble molecules uh, that go directly through that phospholipid bilayer down their concentration gradient. So going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Osmosis, this is the diffusion of water uh, through the lipid bilayer. Again, these two types of membrane transport do not require uh, ATP or do not require energy. Uh, this next part of the diagram in C, we can see facilitated diffusion. Now, facilitated diffusion is a type of membrane transport where we have movement of molecules down their concentration gradient, however, using uh, an integral protein. So we talked about integral proteins being embedded within that phospholipid bilayer. A facilitated diffusion is basically uh, the diffusion of molecules going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration with the help of uh, an integral protein. So facilitated basically means it's, uh, it requires help. 
Um, and we can see here it's getting help from an integral protein that will span the plasma membrane and help with the passage of particular solutes across the membrane. Then we have active transport. So active transport, as its name implies, requires energy. Um, so the integral proteins will move molecules across the plasma membrane against their concentration gradient. So in order to go against their concentration gradient, meaning instead of going from high to low, it goes from areas of low concentration to high concentrations. Um, and this requires energy to do so. So uh, active transport, uh, we can see that integral proteins will move molecules across the plasma membrane with the uh, aid of ATP. So use ATP as an energy, energy source to actively pump substances across the plasma membrane ac uh, against their concentration gradient. Okay. So again, just a quick recap of the different of of more types of uh, membrane transport, facilitated fusion, movement of molecules down their concentration gradient through the use of integral protein, active transport requiring a energy, requiring an ATP, in which the integral proteins will move molecules and pump them across the plasma membrane against their concentration gradient. Then we have uh, more means of transport. Here we have endocytosis. Uh, endo meaning inner. So endocytosis is a mechanism by which particles enter cells. And we have different types. We have two main types here um, that we can see of endocytosis. Uh, it basically, depending upon the type of substance that is um, being moved. So phagocytosis, and this is basically the cell engulfing solids or cell eating. Think of um, a Pac-Man cell. So if you've ever played Pac-Man, which is an old school uh, video game, you can see Pac-Man kind of engulfing little pellets or, you know, those ghosts or whatever. Um, um, so that would uh, be an example of phagocytosis. Now, penocytosis is different from phagocytosis because it involves fluids. So penocytosis is cell drinking. We have receptor-mediated endocytosis. This is when plasma proteins will bind to certain molecules. It will then invaginate and form a coated pit and then pinch off to become a coated vesicle. Uh, this is a method by which a hormone, hormones such as insulin or other hormones, um, enzymes, and low-density lipoproteins can enter cells. So here we see the three types of endocytosis. We have phagocytosis, when the cell will engulf a large pot, uh, particle um, and enclose it, sort of like a Pac-Man cell. Um, we have penocytosis, which is basically um, the uh, engulfing of fluids. Um, so infolding of the plasma membrane will carry a drop of extracellular fluid containing solutes into the cell um, and form, forming a tiny membrane-bound vesicle. Uh, no receptors are used, so process is nonspecific. And then we have receptor-mediated endocytosis. So we have the use of receptors. So extracellular substances will bind to specific receptors um, or specific receptor proteins in regions of protein-coated pits. Uh, this enables the cell to ingest and uh, concentrate specific substances in protein-coated vesicle, vesicles. Um, this ingested substance can uh, be simply released inside the cell or combined with a lysosome to ingest or digest whatever contents are within that um, vesicle. And then once uh, this has occurred, receptors can be recycled and go back to the plasma membrane. So if endo means um, moving stuff into the cell, exo or exocytosis is movement of substances out of the cell. So exocytosis is a mechanism that moves substances out of the cell, a substance will usually be enclosed in a vesicle and then will move towards the plasma membrane where um, the contents of the vesicle will then 
uh, erupt or uh, move out of the vesicle into the extracellular fluid. So here we can see the process of exocytosis. We have that vesicle. So the molecule to be, to be secreted will migrate towards the plasma membrane in a membrane-bound vesicle. Uh, once it reaches the plasma membrane, uh, proteins will uh, bind the vesicle to the plasma uh, membrane, and then the vesicle and plasma membrane will fuse. A pore will open up, and the contents within the vesicle will be released to the uh, exterior of the cell. And here we can see a really nice photomicrograph of uh, the contents of the vesicle being released via exocytosis to um, the outside of the cell. So the cytoplasm uh, is a structure that lies internal or inside uh, to the plasma membrane and, will, and consists of cytosol, organelles, and other inclusions. Cytosol is a jelly-like fluid in which other cellular elements are suspended and consists of water, ions, and enzymes. So the first organelle or cytoplasmic organelle that we're going to talk about are ribosomes. Ribosomes are constructed of proteins and ribosomal RNA and are not surrounded by a membrane. Ribosomes are important because this is the site of protein synthesis. Um, we have an assembly of proteins called, um, which is called translation. Basically, the ribosomes are the assembly line of the manufacturing plant where um, substances are assembled to form proteins. Free ribosomes function within the cytosol and we have also ribosomes that are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, these ribosomes attached to the ER make proteins to help renew the plasma membrane, also make proteins that are exported from the cell. Speaking of the ER, or the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER is a system of membrane-walled envelopes and tubes throughout the cytoplasm, and we have two different types of ER. We have rough ER, um, which actually gets its appearance because we have ribosomes that um, are found within the external surfaces of the endoplasmic reticulum. So it kind of um, gives it that rough looking appearance. And then we have smooth ER. So if it is smooth ER, there are no ribosomes attached. And if there are no ribosomes, no protein synthesis occurs within the smooth ER. So the smooth ER consists of tubules in a branching network. Again, no ribosomes are attached to the smooth ER. That's why it has its smooth appearance. And here we can see uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. We have the rough ER with the ribosomes kind of studded uh, uh, throughout the surface of the ER here. Um, again, this is where we have uh, protein synthesis. And then we have smooth ER, so no ribosomes, meaning no protein synthesis. The next organelle is the Golgi apparatus. Um, the Golgi apparatus is a stack of three to ten disc-shaped envelopes. Uh, this uh, organelle sorts products of the rough ER and then sends them to their proper destination. The products of the rough ER will move through the Golgi from uh, the convex uh, side to the concave side of the Golgi apparatus. So the Golgi apparatus is basically the packaging and shipping division of the manufacturing plant. So it's the FedEx of the cell. <laughs> So here we see uh, many vesicles in the process of pinching off um, from the Golgi apparatus. So products coming from the rough ER being packaged and shipped through the Golgi apparatus. So just this is the sequence of events uh, from the rough ER where protein synthesis takes place to the final distribution um, of these proteins once it has gone through packaging and shipping uh, within the Golgi. So protein-containing vesicles will pinch off the rough ER, will migrate to fuse with membranes of the Golgi. 
Um, proteins are then modified within Golgi compartments and are then packaged within different vesicle types. So we can see um, they're being placed into uh, these vesicles containing the proteins and then um, will then be shipped off depending on their ultimate destination. Uh, sometimes it's towards the plasma membrane where the contents will then uh, be shipped out of the cell. Or it could end up um, being incorporated into the plasma membrane or the proteins can, um, uh, can then stay within the cell. And these proteins can be used um, as digestive enzymes to break down any, um, any particles that might, might come within the cell. The next organelle um, we're going to talk about is lysosomes. So lysosomes are membrane-walled sacs containing digestive enzymes. Um, these digest any unwanted substances and are also known as the demolition crew. So basically they break down and digest any unwanted substances within the cell. Here's just some pictures of uh, an electron micrograph of lysosomes containing those enzymes. Um, and then we can see the light green areas are regions where materials are being digested. A very important organelle that we talked about earlier was the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are surrounded by a double-walled membrane and generate most of the cell's energy. They are known as the power plant or the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, the mitochondria release energy stored in chemical bonds and will transfer this energy to help produce ATP, also known as adenotriphosphate, basically what we use for energy. So cells with very high energy requirements will have more mitochondria like we talked about earlier. For example, uh, muscle cells will need more mitochondria because they need more ATP to function. Um, the mitochondria are the most complex organelle. They actually contain some maternally inherited DNA. So we, we get our mitochondria um, from our mothers. Uh, we also think that the mitochondria might have arisen from bacteria. So here we can see the structure of the um, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, we have an outer membrane and then uh, an inner membrane, and then we see these folds known as cristae. And then we have enzymes uh, within the cristae of the mitochondria. Next organelle are peroxisomes. These are membrane-walled sacs of oxidase enzymes. Uh, peroxisomes are enzymes that help neutralize any free radicals and help break down poisons. They also can break down long chains of fatty acids. Peroxisomes are very numerous in the liver and kidneys because they basically help detoxify things. We know that the liver and kidneys are very important in detoxification um, of our blood. So peroxisomes are the toxic waste removal system of the cell. Then we have the cytoskeleton. This is the cell skeleton, which is an elaborate network of rods, and we have three different types of rods. We have microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. So microtubules being cylindrical structures made up of proteins, microfilaments being filaments of contractile protein actin, um, very important uh, when we talk about movement and contraction um, of these proteins, um, specifically in, in skeletal muscle. And then we have intermediate filaments, which are protein fibers. So microfilaments are strands made of spherical protein subunit called actins, and we can see that here um, kind of... Uh, crisscrossing and, and um, being closely associated with one another. Microfilaments form the blue network surrounding the pink nucleus in the photo. So again, these are part of the cytoskeleton. We then have intermediate filaments. These are tough, insoluble protein fibers that are constructed like woven ropes. And then we have microtubules. These are hollow tubes of spherical protein subunits called tubulins. Again, um, helping form that cytoskeletal element within the cell. 
Other organelles include centrosomes and centrioles. A uh, centrosome is a spherical structure in the cytoplasm composed of the centrosome matrix and centrioles. So uh, centri centrosomes being made up of centrioles. Um, centrioles are paired cylindrical bodies, consist of 27 short microtubules, also act in forming cilia, and are very necessary for um, an event called karyokinesis or nuclear division. So this occurs uh, during mitosis. We also have cytoplasmic inclusions, which are temporary structures and not present in all cell types. Um, these inclusions may consist of pigments, uh, crystals of protein, as well as food stores. So such inclusions include uh, lipid droplets. Um, these are found in liver cells and fat cells. We also have glycosomes, which help store sugar in the form of glycogen. So. Uh, we know that glucose is very important to help us uh, perform certain functions. Um, and then the stored form of glucose is known as glycogen. So the next very important organelle is the nucleus. Nucleus is the control center of the cell. We know that DNA directs the cell's activities. DNA is contained within the nucleus. Um, DNA is important for providing instructions for protein synthesis. You know, we get our DNA from our parents, and um, protein synthesis is important because it basically directs things such as eye color or hair color or, you know, um, all sorts of things, sorts of traits that we get from our parents. So the nucleus is approximately 5 microns in diameter. And here we see uh, the purple structure. It's not usually purple, but in this figure it is purple. We can see the nucleus um, as well as the uh, nucleolus. And we see that it is surrounded by cisterns of the rough ER. Again, rough ER containing ribosomes, which is very important in protein synthesis. And we know that the DNA within the nucleus directs uh, protein synthesis. So the nucleus is surrounded by the nuclear envelope. These are two parallel membranes separated by a fluid-filled space. We have um, nuclear pores that penetrate the nuclear envelope, which allow large molecules to pass in and out of the nucleus. And then we have within the nucleus the nucleolus. This is also known as the little nucleus. In the center of the nucleus contains parts of several chromosomes and is the site of ribosome subunit assembly. So speaking of chromatin and chromosomes, we have what is known as DNA. DNA is your deoxyribonucleic acid. Um, Basically, DNA is a double helix composed of four subunits. We have our thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Um, we have purines and pyrimidines. A way to remember that is uh, pure as gold. So purines include the, um, the subunits of adenine and guanine, and the pyrimidines are uh, thymine and cytosine. So DNA is packed with protein molecules. Uh, DNA is, um, plus proteins form chromatin. So each cluster of DNA and histone proteins is considered to be called a nucleosome. And here we see the double helix structure of DNA and we have pairings um, of different nucleotides or different subunits. So we can see that uh, adenine will bind with um, thymine, and this bond is through a hydrogen bond. And then we see the pairing of cytosine um, with guanine. Okay, so purines and pyrimidines will basically bind with one another and form this uh, double helical structure that we know to be DNA. 
So we have um, different regions within the DNA. Extended chromatin is the active region um, where the DNA's genetic code will be copied into messenger RNA and transcription. Basically, messenger RNA um, takes um, that code from the DNA to allow for um, formation or for protein synthesis. We also have condensed chromatin. These are tightly coiled nucleosomes. This is the inactive form of chromatin. So chromosomes are the highest level of organization of chromatin. Uh, chromosomes contain a long molecule of DNA and a typical human cell contains 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs of uh, chromosomes. One from mom, one from dad. So here we see uh, the DNA double helix. We have the active region known as the extended chromatin. Um, and then we can see how they start to tightly bind and condense to then form um, the highest level, which is the chromosome. So we have important events in, uh, within the cell that allow for replication. We have mitosis. Mitosis is cell division. Um, basically, replicated DNA of the original cell will be parceled out into two new cells. Uh, mitosis is also known as the stage of threads. So before we get into mitosis, we have to talk about the cell life cycle. Um, the cell life cycle is the series of changes that a cell will undergo. Uh, the first stage being interphase. So within interphase, the cell grows and carries on its usual activities, you know, whatever it's supposed to do, depending on the type of cell it is. Um, it then will uh, enter the M phase or mitotic phase. This is when the cell will divide into two cells. Now interphase, again, where the cell just carries on its normal activities, there are different phases with the interphase. So first we have the G1 phase, the, also known as the growth one or gap one phase. This is the first part of interphase. This is when the cell is metabolically active. Um, this is when the cell will make proteins and grow very rapidly. And the length of interphase can vary in, um, from hours to maybe years. We know, uh, for example, in, in females, uh, their egg cell can stay within interphase for years until, you know, um, a female will hit puberty. Uh, centrioles, we talked about these structures before. Centrioles will begin to replicate near the end of the G1 phase or the growth phase. So next within interphase, we have the synthetic phase, also known as the S phase. This is when DNA replicates itself. Uh, the S phase ensures that daughter cells will receive identical copies of the genetic material. Um, here we have uh, when the chromatone is extended. So, And then from the S phase, we will hit the G2 phase or the growth 2 phase or gap 2 phase. This is when centrioles will finish copying themselves. Uh, enzymes, specific enzymes are needed for cell division. Um, and these are synthesized in G2 phase. Now, note that during the S phase or synthetic phase and G2 phases, again, the, ser the cell will carry on its normal activities. So here we just see a basic schematic of the cell life cycle. Uh, first, starting off with our interphase and the different um, subphases within interphase. So we have our G1 or growth phase, and we, and then we have our S phase. Um, or synthetic phase where we have growth and DNA synthesis. And then we have our G2 phase, uh, which is where we have growth and final preparation for cell division. And then we hit a G2 checkpoint where the cell will finally, you know, decide that it's time to enter the M phase or mitotic phase. And then we see the different phases within mitosis. Um, good way to remember uh, the different phases in mitosis is PMAT. 
Um, so prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Um, and then we have cytokinesis, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. So why is it important to know the different uh, stages within the cell cycle? Well, in pharmacology specifically, especially if we are, say, trying to treat um, cancer cells, we know cancer is an abnormal growth or abnormal production of um, abnormal cells. So if we can find a drug that stops the cellular, um, the cell cycle in different phases of the cell cycle, we can potentially stop the abnormal growth of these cancer cells. So it's very important to know what drugs, you know, uh, affect which different phases. So now that we have finished interphase, the cell will then undergo cellular division. Um, cell division is very important um, for body growth and repairs. Every day we are sloughing off old cells. Um, even in our digestive system, as we eat food, as we you know, uh, bring things throughout our GI, the top layer of the epithelium is constantly being worn away. So cell division is important because it helps um, increase cell growth, or allows for body growth and repair of itself. So the first um, stage that we're going to talk about, of course, is um, the M phase or the mitotic phase. During this stage, we know that cells will divide and the M phase will follow um, interphase, which we just talked about, the G1, the S phase, and the G2 phase. So cell division involves two important events. We have mitosis and then cytokinesis. Mitosis is the division of a nucleus during cell division. Here we have um, chromosomes that are distributed to the two daughter nuclei. And then we have cytokinesis, which is a division of the cytoplasm. And this will occur after the nucleus has divided. So getting into the different stages of mitosis, we have the first stage, which is prophase. Prophase is the longest, the first and longest stage of mitosis. Uh, prophase can be further divided into early and late. So with early prophase, the chromatin threads will condense into chromosomes. We know that chromosomes are made up of two threads called chromatids, also known as sister chromatids. Chromatids are held together by the centromere. We'll then have central pairs which will separate from one another and we can see that a mitotic spindle formed and this is in early prophase. In late prophase, the centrioles will continue moving away from each other towards their different poles um, and we can see nuclear membrane fragments. So here we see interphase where, you know, cell continues on its normal activities. Uh, and then once we start the M phase, we will get into um, early prophase. Uh, we can see uh, chromosomes consisting of two sister chromatids. Uh, we can see an early mitotic spindle. And then in late prophase, um, we can see that the centrioles are moving farther apart. Um, and uh, we can see fragments of the nuclear envelope, meaning it has broken down and the contents are starting to spill out. Then the second stage of mitosis is metaphase. Um, this is when we have chromosomes that will cluster at the middle of the cell. The centromeres are aligned along the equator, forming what is known as the metaphase plates. Um, after metaphase, we have anaphase. This is the third and shortest stage of mitosis. Here, the centromeres of the chromosomes will split. And finally, we have telophase. Telophase begins as chromosomal movement stops. So chromosomes are at the opposite poles of the cell and will begin to uncoil. Uh, they will resume their thread-like extended chromatin form, and then a new nuclear membrane forms. 
So here we can see the, the, the other stages of mitosis. So we have metaphase. Um, an important thing to remember of metaphase is that, that formation of the metaphase plates. Uh, anaphase, we can see uh, the daughter chromosomes kind of moving away from one another. And then at telophase, we can see um, a formation of a nuclear envelope. Um, and then uh, we can see the beginning of cytokinesis with a uh, contractile ring at this structure called the cleavage furrow. So it's starting to actually form two separate cells. Oops. So um, this is a really good video showing uh, the different stages of mitosis. Let's see if we can kind of get this working. Whoops. Right, let's see if this video works. Okay, so uh, we can see the different phases of mitosis. And it happens actually rather quickly. Um, so we have uh, prophase, and then um, we have, oh, there they go. So when they lined up, they formed this metaphyseal plate, um, and then as they moved apart, that was anaphase. Actually, we, we can see the metaphyseal plates here, and then we can see the separation of the uh, chromatids into their two separate cells. So it happens actually rather quickly. So formation at the metaphyseal plate. Here's that plate, and then we'll have separation. Anaphase happens really quickly. So here's the metaphase plate. And then do 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 do. That's really cool. And then it separates anaphase and then telophase and then cytokinesis. So that's really cool that they kind of slowed that down for you. So then finally we have cytokinesis. Basically this completes the division of the cell into two separate daughter cells. Cytokinesis literally means cells moving apart. Uh, cytokinesis begins during anaphase and is completed after mitosis ends. We have a ring of actin and myosin filaments which will constrict and then pinch the cell into two separate cells. And then once the, uh, we have two new cells, the daughter cells will then enter their own interface. Okay, so that is chapter two on cells and mitosis. And that is it for this lecture.